What else is out there? What what lies beyond this this physical world? What is here? It felt, it was, it was like the air changed. And I heard footsteps coming down the stairs. Bam, 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 bam. Hello and welcome back to the Waterstones podcast. I'm Will Rycroft and this is our second season of talking to authors around a different theme. So what can you expect from the weeks ahead? Well, the next six episodes will be coming at you weekly for starters. So get ready for a studio guest in each podcast and some fabulous names we have too. I'm also joined by Holly. How are you doing, Holly? I'm so very well, thank you, Will. Have you had a nice little gap? You know, done some nice it's stuff It's been since? okay, a little hectic. Welcome yeah. back to you too. Well, it's very nice to be back. It's We've, so nice. We have been through a very busy period in the shop, mm. haven't we, since we last spoke in yes. the studio. You see these bags under my eyes, <laughs> these grey hairs? I can't see them because of the bags under mine. <laughs> Um, Now, why don't you tell us what we've got coming up, actually, in the next few episodes? Of course. So next week, we have Robert McFarlane on Outside Topic, and that's followed by Richard Iowadi on Culture, and Patchett on Community, Malcolm Gladwell on Meetings, and Jay Rayner on Eating. Plus, there will be appearances from authors like Sally Rooney, Jason Reynolds, Lara Williams, and even icons like... Debbie Harry! <laughs> <laughs> I got to speak to Debbie Harry and it was one of those surreal moments where you were like, I- I'm talking to Debbie Harry. How is this actually happening? But anyway, we'll come to that in another episode. This week, because of course we are at the end of October, how could we resist the theme of haunting? We'll be hearing from Andrew Michael Hurley about his folk horror infused fiction, from Jeanette Winterson about her actual experiences with the supernatural in her home in Spitalfields, and joining us in the studio is an author who defined a generation with his debut novel, The Perks of Being a Wallflower, and has made us wait two whole decades for his next novel. Imaginary Friend has been championed by John Green, RJ Palacio and Emma Watson amongst many others. It is a pleasure to welcome one of the best connected writers in Hollywood, Stephen Jaboski. It is wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for coming here. You're, you're, you're over here from the States. I am, yes. I got here two days ago. And you had an event last night where lots of people, I, I, I talked about The Perks of Being a Wallflower being a book that defined a generation. And that sounds like a big statement, but so many people have connected with that book and you must get people coming up to you all the time saying... Well, you know, I, I do. I have to say, like, listen, you can hear the helicopters right now. That is not <laughs> about the environmental strikes or anything. That is, they're, they're following me. They're fans. Um, yeah, I have to say, in, in all seriousness, that I have, I have been out on the road now for two weeks. My book came out, yeah, like two weeks ago yesterday. And in the United States, I'm now here in London, and I'm going to Bath uh, later today. Um, every event has been pretty remarkable. And you, I've received letters over the decades for people that, that have written to me and say how much the book has meant to them, but to meet people up close and personal in every event that at least one person in line is going to, you know, I'll sign them or, or shake their hand or whatever and they'll start to cry. Mm-hmm. And you realize, you look up and let's say it's someone that read it 15 years ago and they went through very, some very dark days in school and now they're in their 30s or they're in their 20s and things are better for them mm-hmm. and that the book helped them. It's, it's, it's wonderfully gratifying. It's been a long wait for book number two. It has. I mean, you've been busy. You've yes, been yeah, I've been turning a lot of into a film. Yes, absolutely. You directed Wonder. I directed Wonder. Yes, I, I love I love books, and so adapting books in, to the screen is is one of my great pleasures. And to do it for the when I did the movie version of The Birds Being a Wallflower, that was my foray into it. I love doing it, and then I try to do it with R.J. Palacio's book. Mostly to do, you know, it's like Hollywood gave me $20 million to make a book commercial. That's how I looked at it. I was like, and, and by the way, everybody was on board. Julie Roberts, we all loved the book. And so yeah. that's why we did it. So Imaginary Friend was something that you have clearly been working on for a long time. Yes. Uh, has it been f- f- for, you know, for those 20 years or how long? No, I thought of the that? idea maybe 15, 16 years ago. And it started with this just image that we all have from childhood. We all remember, you know, you look up in the sky, you see the clouds and we all looked at the shape of the clouds. Like, oh, that looks like a dog, hammer, face, whatever. My idea was what would happen if a little boy looked up into the sky and realized that for the last two weeks, it was always the same face looking back at him. I thought, oh, that was a really great origin idea for, for a scary story, but also one with a lot of heart. And, and because it was mysterious, I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what that cloud was. And I became obsessed with that idea. So I was thinking about it while I was doing other things. Then about 10 years ago, this is, once I started writing the screenplay for the Perks Being Wallflower movie, um, I, I rediscovered the book. And I said, I want to do this again. Mm. I, I, I fell in love because when I wrote The Perks Being Wallflower, because I was most, most of my training is in movies, most of my professional experiences in movies, I just thought I was a, quote, movie guy, unquote. And so I thought, oh, well, I guess that was a fluke. It was a one-off, I, I, you know. And but reading it again and realizing that it had merit as as a piece of literature, um, 
inspired me to try it again. And, and now it won't take me 20 years to write a third book, I'll tell you that. Because <laughs> I, I really, I, I love doing it. I'm, I'm glad to be back. You mentioned that the, the sort of the genesis of the idea for Imaginary Friend, and it does what I think works so well often in horror, which is to take something ordinary and to just put a little twist on it, something uncanny. So that idea of seeing the same face every time you look at that cloud. It reminded me of one of my favourite episodes of Doctor Who, which is an episode called Blink, uh, which features these weeping angels, which are statues. But when you blink, they can move. And of course, Ah. blinking is something that we all have to do. And that's what's so terrifying about it, is that whilst these statues are completely still and have these terrifying expressions on them, every time the characters blink, they move a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer. Oh, I have to see it. I haven't seen this episode. Oh, I can't wait. You have to. And Fantastic. It's, sort of, it's that thing of taking something completely ordinary and making it horrific. Holly, what scares you? Or are you the kind of person who's just like, I don't get scared. I'm scared of so many things. Oh, yeah. The other evening, actually, this was a creepy one. Here we go. I was just falling asleep and the torch on my phone turned on. And I was like, that's strange. Why did you do that? I looked at my phone and it had started street screen recording and I had not set it to screen record. So I stopped the screen recording and I still have it. And it's an hour, it's a minute and a half of just random things being pressed on my phone, random apps being downloaded without me touching it. That And it's been recorded. That's a bit weird. Horrible. Who, but you weren't touching the phone? No. Okay, so that's a sort of mixture of surveillance state and poltergeist there we go yeah or just a hacker or just or a, a hacker, hacker. <laughs> just a straight up honest hacker yeah, totally so um uh, what, again sort of developing your your the genesis of your idea there's this sort of quite a nice simple conceit which is this idea of this boy who goes missing for six days yes. and then when he comes back things are very very different but he can't remember what's happened he can't yeah when he when he follows the cloud into the woods and then goes missing um, and when he comes back and this boy that struggled with reading uh, and has very severe dyslexia, finally he realizes, wow, why can I read now? And why I never was good at math and now I'm getting perfects. And so his intelligence and his emotional intelligence and all these things begin to develop. And I love the idea of the wish fulfillment of that, but, but the idea that maybe some of those things uh, are, are actually quite ominous. That, it, that it's it's the calm before the storm, you know, because we all know what it's like to struggle and we all know, you know, it's, it's the thing that you're saying, it, it, that episode of Blink, I can't wait to see that, that sounds brilliant, is I, I saw it as akin to, you know, uh, watching cartoons when you were a kid, like it's Saturday morning and you turn on, you turn on the, 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 the telly and you're going to watch, you're going to watch that program and I just thought what would happen if Christopher, the boy in, in my story, is watching Bad Cat. I, I made up Bad Cat because I didn't want to pay Disney rights. You know what I mean? I just made it up. Um, you know, it could have been Elmo. It could have been uh, Mickey Mouse, whatever. So Bad Cat. And then with the idea of like he's watching and suddenly Bad Cat stops the episode and, st- and looks at him and says, oh, hi, Christopher. Are you enjoying the show? And just that idea of like your favorite. And then and then just more like, you know, hey, um, hey, who told you about the skeleton, buddy? Gosh, we need to know. You know, and, and then summoning him closer to the television. Come over here. Yeah. I want to tell you what's going to happen to your mom if you don't tell us and all these things. <laughs> it's just that little thing that we all relate to. We've all watched those those programs and then just move it five degrees to the right. And suddenly it's it's very, very scary. It's just that subtle shift, isn't it? And yes. It can make all the difference. Uh, we all have different things, I suppose, that terrify us. And it's often from childhood, as you say. That's when you get those first inklings. And I wondered what whether there were books that you had read growing up that had instilled the idea of what terrifies readers. Because when you sat down to write Imaginary Friend, it's quite a technical exercise, isn't it, to make sure that you are doing the right things, pressing the right buttons to make readers almost scared to turn the next page. Yes. Well, I, I, some of it was just growing up reading Stephen King. He's a, he's a big hero of mine. Um, seeing the classic movies, whether it's, you know, uh, John Carpenter's Halloween or um, The Exorcist or The Omen or... Uh, you know, Psycho, Hitchcock, it's, that's probably the, the, great, the greatest of them all, certainly the most influential. Um, so it's, I really wrote it as a fan. So those scary moments, um, I, I, I just wrote them as a fan. I was trying to scare myself, A, and B, I was actually trying to exercise some demons from being a kid because everything that scared me as a child is basically in this book okay. um, in some form or another. And what has been really wonderful is, a, and I experienced this with the Perks of Being a Wallflower movie as well, there, I filmed a, a, what a panic attack felt like. And then after that, I basically had no more panic attacks. Here, I wrote about everything that, that frightened me as a child. And, and by doing it and by you know, showing this heroic uh, you know, facing of fear, I was able to let go of 
pretty much all of those fears. Oh, that's mm-hmm. really interesting. I hadn't mm-hmm. realized. So it's almost like a sort of exorcism of those fears. From yes, for sure. Because I ultimately think that's why people love this genre. The, those that do, we love ghost stories or we love haunted stories or we love, um, you know, any kind of supernatural it, is that is that if we all have a, at least a, a vague recollection, we don't think about it every day, that we have our limited amount of time, however much time we're given. So there is this expiration date that is, that is looming. And it is interesting how, and there have been so many studies about this, how, how, de- how we all deal with that inevitability, mm. the fear of it, um, actually makes us more appreciative of what we have today. You know, without the absence of the end, um, the beginning almost has less meaning somehow. It's a difficult thing to say much more about because I don't want to give away too much about the book. So I'm going to I'm going to take that moment to move swiftly on to hear from our first author. Oh, please. The idea, I think, in a lot of horror fiction is this idea of um, what lies underneath. So we think about the ordinary world that we can all see and this idea about what might be just beneath the surface. I think it's quite a common theme in in horror fiction. Um, It's certainly an area which has been mined very well by our next author. Um, Andrew Michael Hurley's debut novel, The Loney, was first published by Tartarus Press, famous publisher of horror, uh, in a limited edition of just 278 copies, but it actually went on to become a massive bestseller and he's followed it with novels like Devil's Day and his latest, Starvaker. I spoke to him about landscape, layers and how to have your readers turning the pages with trepidation. I think it's uh, an obsession that we all have. I think we're all obsessed with, or we will have a kind of, um, um, yeah, so I suppose it's an obsession. I think we, we do sort of think about death and the afterlife uh, per- periodically, and I think this is a reason, reason why um, events like Halloween are still very popular and actually grown in popularity, uh, I think, over the last, the last uh, few decades, for sure. And I think it's just that perennial fascination we have with, with death and, and, and the afterlife. I think because um, we've, we haven't really got to the point where science can, can explain what happens afterwards. And while that gap remains, I think that it'll always be filled with stories and, and, and superstition uh, and things like religion as well. But well, I think I've always been interested in, in that kind of thing ever since I was a child. Quite where that fascination comes from, I, I don't know. Um, I was brought up as a Roman Catholic, so maybe that you know this sort of idea of angels and demons and heaven and hell, and maybe that had a, had a bearing on the kinds of stories that that, uh, that I like to, to to read about. But I sort of devoured those uh, Osborne guides to the supernatural world, so ghosts and monsters and uh, UFOs and things like that. Um, so I don't know. I think I think it's just it's, it's a fascination with that that with, with possibility. I think the, the, what 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 else is out there? What what lies beyond this this sort of physical world? It's um, the novel is set in the Yorkshire Dales, so just sort of over the Lancashire border into the Yorkshire Dales. So uh, if you can sort of picture Skipton, Malham, uh, that kind of area, um, quite remote, pretty sort of cut off, quiet. Um, it's a place that that I know reasonably well. That's the sort of place we used to go on holiday when I when I was a kid. Uh, so we didn't go to uh, anywhere sort of exotic. Um, we used to go camping in, in Cumbria or we'd go and stay in a small caravan in, in, in the Yorkshire Dales. Um, I probably moaned like, like hell about it at the time, but I think it stood, <laughs> it stood me in good stead. And I think those those sort of places have really stayed with me. I think I think I was just always more interested in those places than, than you know, the sort of suburbs where I, where I lived. Um, when I was, when I went on holiday, um, all I wanted was the a sort of book of local ghost stories. And you know, if I found that in a bookshop, I, that was, I was kind of happy for the rest of the holiday. Then, so um, I don't. I think I've just always been interested in, in in layers. I think I think that's the way that I would maybe describe my work. Actually, that when I'm writing about landscape, I'm writing not only about the, the sort of the physical geography and topography of it, but also the those layers underneath of, of history and mythology and, and folklore. And I, I I like the idea of um, adding another layer to that to that place and adding another story to it. They, they seem like places that are really ripe for that kind of storytelling. It's sort of the essence of folk horror as well. I think that's one of the sort of um, key elements of folk horror, that idea of unearthing something ancient uh, and bringing it into the, into the present and reminding us, I think, of, of what we don't know and what we can't explain. And I think that's where a lot of the, the sort of horror or the terror comes from in that, in that kind of writing. Um, and yeah, again, I think it's just that idea of what what is what is buried underneath. What what do we sort of bury um, in in the land? What does the land retain in some way? Um, and it's a, a feeling, or it's or it's a story, or it's a a, a presence. Yeah, well, I, I want to retain an, an ambiguity really about what the supernatural is, or where the super, supernatural lies in, in in my novels. And so, um, 
it, it's part of that balance that I try and create between what what I uh, give to the reader, what I explain to the reader, and what I withhold from them uh, as well. And um, I mean, hopefully, the you know the readers will go away from Star Baker as, as they did with the Loney and Devil's Day, with more questions than than answers. Hopefully, I'm a big fan of um, Shirley Jackson. Um, she's one of the sort of big influences on my writing, and I think she does something very similar. You know, she sets up these worlds that are very recognisable. They're, they're sort of about ordinary people in ordinary situations. But I think what I like uh, about her writing is something that I've tried to sort of emulate in my own is the way that she kind of stretches the edges of that reality um, and allows these other other things to come in uh, as a, as a way of trying to discuss though those things like guilt or, or grief or bereavement or. Um, that feeling of kind of isolation, maybe or alienation. So rather than it being discussed in a, in a, in a kind of wholly real world, there are sort of other layers to to that experience that may or may not be supernatural. They may or may not be real, but they are sort of present nonetheless. So Stephen, a fellow Roman Catholic, there. Yes. Did what he have to say about sort of folk horror and that idea of landscape and layers chime with with what you're thinking as well uh, you're uh, quite uh, we would have a wonderful wonderful dinner talking <laughs> about all of these all of these subjects because i was fascinated by what he said about layers and also about the idea of the supernatural one thing that i thought about was for me layers can also mean emotional layers a lot of my work um uh, you know even even something more of like a family film like wonder i love the idea of you go in with a certain set of um of of uh, I guess prejudice or certain certain uh, assumption about what things mean, and by the end of a story, you realize that the person that you hated actually has a much harder life than even the person you're rooting for. Mm. And by the time you get to the end, there there's almost redemption for all. It, I, I don't see that as a saccharine uh, uh, kind of um, uh, idea, but just the more we get to know people, the more the harder it is to hate them. Right, and I believe that. So for me, it's an emotional layer. Some of that thing about supernatural, what I love about it, and something I explored quite a bit in Imaginary Friend, is this an idea of like let's say a dual question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll start with something about let's say mental illness. So Christopher and Christopher's mother, um, they remember how uh, Christopher's father passed away, and he struggled with mental illness. And he and before he died, he said this little uh, riddle to his wife. He made this little joke of of Kate. What are the two types of people who things see things that aren't there? And, and his little whisper of a punchline, visionaries and psychopaths, okay? That idea, whether it's, okay, so let's say you see somebody on the street and they're talking to themselves, right? You're going to walk a little more quickly past, past them in the street. But let's say you're alone in your own car and you're talking to yourself mm. because you're trying to work out some things. Mm. Or let's say you're in a church or even wherever you are and let's say you pray. You, you pray. And people can look at this in terms of his, the supernatural or the, uh, the thing that we cannot see, what is imaginary or it is real. Is, is it prayer? Is it talking to yourself? Are you mad for doing it? And if it's comforting, ultimately, does it even matter? Mm. Right? That is another thing. So what he's talking about and, and what I loved writing about this particular story, what I, what I love writing, is through a lot of the book, you can ask yourself, is this whole thing some uh, figment of a child's imagination? And these things that, are, that, that we are afraid of, um, are they just imagination gone amok? I love all those, those layers. A lot of them are emotional, but, but ultimately I ask those questions. I disagree with him with one thing. <laughs> and, and not, he loves people leaving with more questions. Yeah. Which I, th I, I admire that. I think it's great. I like posing the question because what I want is for the reader to answer it. Mm -hmm. However they want to say, is he mad? Or is he, uh, is he, uh, does he have sight? Is it this or is it that? Because ultimately, it's almost like a Rorschach test. The reader, to me, is the most interesting part of a book. And it'll always be. That's the person being a wallflower. That's imaginary friend. No matter what I do, it's always that. Yeah, I think we've, we've spoken in the past, haven't we, Holly, about how it's the reader that completes the book, the experience yes. of reading. Yeah. And it seems that's even more the case with something supernatural or uncanny, mm. which is it's up to the reader to, to decide what their explanation is for it, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure you've read books like that. Right? Yes, yeah. And the point that I found most interesting, actually, that I just wanted to touch upon briefly is at the beginning where he talks about this fascination with Halloween yes. and how become how it has become so much more popular. And he says that that's because of people's interest and fascination with death. And I actually want to flip that and, in fact, disagree and say I think it's maybe not so much that and Halloween's maybe kind of lost its context and its origins and that now it is more as we talked about with Anne Patchett mm. with different celebrations and things like this it suddenly becomes so much more commercial and that's what people buy into it's not necessarily the traditions 
that it was once known for. It's easy to forget, isn't it? We have bonfire night, which mm. we all kind of, ooh, we send up fireworks into the air and we kind of go, and we forget that this was about a plot to try and kill the king, which yes. resulted in lots of people being executed. Mm. And it's sort of, huh. we kind of forget that. Yeah. Even the people who were sticking an actual guy on their bonfire mm. to sort of represent Guy Fawkes being burnt at the stake, it's sort of, it's very easy, isn't it, to forget the historical mm. origins of something. Well, yes. And what you've done with Imaginary Friend and, and Andrew's done with Starbaker is to do that thing of really pulling history right into the present. Yes. And to kind of go, what are you going to do about that? You know, how does that make you feel? Mm. So we have spoken a little bit about how horror works with fiction. Uh, and I think it's time now to bring things into a sort of non-fiction context. Quick straw poll here in the studio. Uh, Holly, do you believe in ghosts? Yes. Oh, Stephen? Yes, and I have proof. <gasps> okay, well, I don't. Uh, but like you two, our next author does, even though she can't explain where they come from. Um, Jeanette Winterson featured in the last episode of season one of our podcast, uh, and her novel Frankenstein allowed us to look at the notion of family, just not just today, but into the future as well. We didn't actually expect to have her back on the podcast so soon, but when she tells you that she's lived in not one but two haunted houses, you damn well listen. I suppose when I think about haunting, I think about it on different levels. Um, in that I do believe in ghosts, but I don't know where they come from, um, because technically it can't happen, except that twice I've lived in haunted houses where there have been... Uh, phenomena which was not explicable by any of the ordinary laws of physics, uh, including fearful cold spots where animals wouldn't go, um, and banging uh, in the middle of the night. I have an old house in Spitalfields, which is a 1790s house. I love Georgian houses. I, I, they, 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 I love the history of them, what they contain. Uh, I like to see the past in layers in London. It's, it's, it, London itself is a haunted city. How could it not be? Um, you know, the Romans were here. So when I go to my house now, it all seems quite serene and calm. But when I first bought it, I was excavating the basement. Um, and I mean, I don't mean like an oligarch and putting a swimming pool in there. I just mean so that I could stand up in it. And one night I was sleeping in the basement for, for various reasons and I heard footsteps coming down the stairs. Bam, 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 bam. And I, I'd been deeply asleep. I woke up and I said, hello. And there was no, nothing. I thought, oh, it's a dream. And my hand was out of the duvet and I distinctly felt another hand pick up mine and take my pulse. And for some reason I said, I'm alive. And... My hand was immediately dropped down to the side of the bed and I heard bam, 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 back up the wooden stairs. No door slamming or anything. So I lay there for a while thinking, this is a bit strange. Um, I, then I went upstairs, there was nothing at all. Went back to sleep. Anyway, some weeks later during the course of the excavation, we found in the vault, which was much older than the house, the vault was probably from the plague years of London, so 1660s. Um, we found uh, a doctor's bag with various items in it, which we gave to the London Museum. Um, and I wonder if we disturbed something, because I felt that I was, I was just being tested to see if I was alive, as if it was the plague, perhaps. Um, and I have no explanation for it. Everybody just says, oh, you dreamed it. But I know that I didn't. And that's all I can say, that I know that I was not asleep and that this thing took place. So that made me wonder about whether, what is a haunting? Is it trapped energy? Because, you know, energy is real and it's not, it's not bound to materiality. This is something that's always interested me, partly because of, you know, all the religious systems of the world have always said, well, the spirit and the soul um, are not contingent on materiality, which is why the idea of artificial intelligence feels comfortable to me too, because, um, and I grew up thinking this world is not my home, the body is just a casing, you know, our real self goes, goes elsewhere at death, blah, blah, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But there, the idea of an en energy which can be released from its physical substrate and then perhaps hang around mm. and then be released again, um, you know, an excavation which then perhaps just goes off like a firework and then it's gone. Maybe, I don't know. But I do know that that happened. But I think, you know, as well as this sort of phenomena out there, most of us spend our lives feeling haunted by something or other. I mean, we're haunted by our past. We're haunted by something that we've done and the wish we hadn't done. Um, 
everything happens in our minds. You know, the brain itself, A, feels immortal uh, and not subject to any of the normal controls, and B, is continually transcending time. So mentally, we always live in at least three zones. We live in the past, the present, and the future, and we move about those zones quite easily. You know, when you're walking down the street, you can be thinking of something 10 years ago. You can be wondering what's going to happen next week. You're sort of only nominally in the present. And the mind manages this um, every day without difficulty. But it also means that we suffer as human beings because the past never does go away. You know, this is something that Freud discovered and that because it doesn't go away, we have the opportunity to change it. It's not that we need to time travel into a, into a zone and uh, literally haunt our own past in order to redeem it, but that we can redeem it by fully remembering it and accepting it and then letting it go. Again, that energy release, perhaps like what happened to me in the basement. Sometimes people say they feel this release, you know, and that's the word they use, from their own, their own hauntings, from their own difficulties, I guess. So as a writer, I'm always dealing with um, the various uh, imaginative and imaginary hauntings of, of, of my characters, because I know I've invented them, but they become real to me and they stay with me. And I'm also dealing with that kind of mental um, strata that we all have, uh, which just feels like an accumulation of many things. You know, it's not just our lifetime, it's the lifetime of, of, of our families, of our ancestors, perhaps of the history which most compels us. Some people feel that they know they were alive in another time and that's real to them. I think I probably was. I think the last time I was here was in the 18th century because it feels so real to me. Um, uh, I feel very at home, uh, both when I'm in Georgian houses and you know, when I'm dealing with all of, all of that. Um, but it is for us as human beings necessary, I think, to make an accommodation with the, the many selves um, that, that, that jostle and, and cluster in, into this, this present self, uh, which we call now. You know, and the Buddhists say be here now and they're right because that is the only way to avoid the haunting of the past. Otherwise, it, it, it is endlessly there. On the other hand, I don't want to just be here now. Um, I'm happy to be connected by some rope slung through space back to a history that I didn't live, but which feels like it's mine. Stephen, you said before that you believe in ghosts and you spoke about living in a haunted house too. We have to hear that story. Uh, I will tell you the story, but uh, very quickly, I have, to, I have to respond to one thing she's talking about, the haunting, the, the past or the personal. Um, and I agree. And, and so much of my writing, and I'll talk about the person. Well, I did it a little bit before. When I filmed Charlie's um, uh, anxiety attack that he had, and not only is it confronting the past, but I remember doing that. And so I, I wrote the book. I write the screenplay. There's that version. I cast it. There's that version. I put all the costumes. That's a version. I film it. That's a version. Take after take after take. I edit it, mix it, master it. Uh, put it through color timing, all these things, what's amazing, and I'll offer to anybody that's listening, is anybody that's known trauma or they've had these difficulties, or whether it's a literal or a figurative haunting, if you go through that exercise, you don't have to make a film, but if you go through that exercise, you start to own that haunting. Mm. It's still there, but but it, do, it doesn't have the same power over you. And so for me, writing or making films, and very often like I put it up on the screen and then I don't have any more anxiety attacks. It goes away forever. And it's just there to help whoever it's it's intended to help. Uh, in terms of the thing that I know, because you're very patiently listening to that answer, <laughs> to get to the thing, the only thing that you care about. No, no, no. And everyone right now <laughs> that's listening to this is just like for, they're nodding. They're like, "Well, oh, good, goody for you that uh, that that you don't have panic attacks anymore." Tell me about the haunted house. Okay. <laughs> So it's two. I will talk about one of them because the other one is actually it's too fresh and too terrifying. Okay. The first one. So my my father in law, my, my my wife's dad, um, he had he had a stroke, and we moved back to New Jersey to help him get it back on his feet. We live in Los Angeles now. We moved back to New Jersey, and we rented a home in Milburn, New Jersey. And the minute I walked into this house, I was like, and my wife had slept there two two nights already. The minute I walked into this, I was like, what is here? It felt, it, it, was, it was like the air changed. Everything was different and I didn't understand. So she said, ah, I didn't want to tell, because she went before me. She's like, I didn't want to say anything, but like, I've had the weirdest nightmares for two nights where this lady with a bonnet is basically standing over my, my bed looking at me oh, and she wants me to leave. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, <laughs> that's very, very chilling. And um, so she put, 
these crystals. And she's not that person. She actually, she was so afraid yeah. of this bonnet lady that she put these crystals in every room, which I guess is supposed to help with energy. Okay, now watch. This is true. I, I swear on my children. So my little daughter, Macy, was one and a half at the time. And so we're walking through the house and she walks to this one room where her, where her crib was going to be. And there is crystal on the mantle. And she goes and she stands in the corner, facing the corner, holds up her finger and goes, no, no, as if she was talking to somebody to say, no, no. And then the crystal fell off the mantle and shattered. Oh my God. Needless to say, we went to the Best Western immediately. <laughs> immediately. And then we lost 3000 because we had paid a month in advance. We lost $3,000 for this oh thing. Now, here's the really fun part. A few months later, we we drove by that street again. Just I just was like, was it, you know, what happened? And it was completely leveled. And they just, I think they just finally just said, whatever it is that's here, we have to uh, we have to get rid of this and just build again because no one's renting it. We rented it from the internet. We didn't know we were in LA. We just needed quick accommodations. Yeah. Thank God we were able to find something else. Did you tell the property agents why you were moving out? No, I didn't because... Uh, you didn't want to sound crazy. Well, there's that. <laughs> but there's also... I also felt like he was also kind of a jerk. And he... he um, Even though we didn't bring a dog, he like charged us like a dog cleaning fee. And it was just... Yeah, he was just not a nice person. Maybe the lady with the bonnet had the dog. Mm, maybe. Ghost dog. Mm. Yeah, ghost okay. dog. But I I, I, I swear, it, it was terrifying. When she was like, no, I'm like, we're out of here. Oh, my God. Yeah, I was, really the, guy, I was the smart guy in the, in the horror movie that says, I'm out of here. Yeah. This is why am I sitting yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? It, it's amazing. By the way, I loved her story, and she's like 1660. I love that her basement is older than my country. Yeah. It's, it's pretty fantastic. <laughs> Everything you need to know right there. Yeah, there it is. Holly, you said you believed in ghosts as well. Mm. What, have you got a story you'd like to, to share with us? No, not because I'm afraid or don't want to. It's just that I have not witnessed anything that I believe to okay, be Okay, but you have a true. sense. That... I just, yeah, okay. just have a feeling, you know? Uh... Yeah, and, and what she said about energy as well, which mm. that is true. And whether Whatever we, we add to the other, listen, I, all I know is we moved away and there was no more no, and there was no more lady with the bonnet dreams, and there was no, you know, yeah, that lady with the bonnet one is out. And then, and then we look back at the house, the history, yeah. and yeah, there was, yeah. There was a lady who died there. Yeah, she was, she was, I, you know, yeah, she died in that house. And I don't think that she knew that she wasn't, like, who are these strangers in my house? Yeah. Oh, my God. Absolutely terrifying. These are, these are great stories. They're true stories. There is, of course, a, such a wealth of literature that we could recommend on this theme of haunting. Uh, For example, Imaginary Friend by Stephen Shabosky. A really good choice. Yes, well done. Uh, Very good. Um, we could almost do a whole separate podcast listing books. But in fact, we're going to take a little tour of the country now and hear from some of our booksellers who are going to give us their recommendations inspired by the word haunting. Hi, I'm Alice from Kirkcaldy, and a great haunting book to read is Ghost Stories by M.R. James, because he has this delightfully subtle way of hiding the ghost in plain sight without the scholarly protagonist or in fact the reader realising it's there, until of course it's too late. Hi, I'm Emily from Barnsley, and on the theme of haunting, I would recommend Rivers of London, which is the first book in the Rivers of London series by Ben Aronovich. It's a police procedural, but with magic, and it all starts when PC Grant interviews a ghost by accident. Hi, I'm Katrina from Glasgow. My recommendation on the topic of haunting is The Near by Michelle Paver. It is a really spooky, tense, atmospheric story of a bunch of mountain climbers heading up on the ascent and suddenly a bit of mountain madness starts to set in and the narrator in particular starts to build this real sense of paranoia, sure that you can see somebody else in the mountain. So there we go. Uh, we have hopefully not left you incapable of sleep tonight, but with just the right sense of the uncanny. Huge thanks to you, Stephen, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and for terrifying us with the idea of Bonnet Lady. I'm not sure I'm going to be all right tonight. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I might write about a Bonnet Lady someday. I might. Watch this space. Um, huge thanks uh, to our other authors, of course, uh, for their contributions. Next week, we'll be donning coats and scarves as we venture outside with Robert McFarlane, Rebecca Solnit and Professor Shane O'Mara. We also want to hear from you the listeners 
listeners, in our last season we asked you for feedback. This season we want to know what you would like future episodes to feature. So you can choose the theme. It's very, very simple. Uh, you can contact us via email on social at waterstones.com and give us your suggestions for themes that you would like us to cover. It's really up to you. Uh, so there we go. That's all from us here. Until our next episode, take care. Farewell. Thank you.